originally from, well, originally from the United States, but uh, we came from Seattle, uh, Washington, where for the about 20 years we formed and facilitated the Gnostic Center there. And it, and it grew well, and, and as we're connected with uh, other Gnostic organizations in our society, uh, we felt the impulse to, to take the Gnostic teachings, these Gnostic teachings, which you may see within the talks similarities to certain elements, but there is also some very unique differences that in time um, will reveal uh, the uniqueness of what the Gnostic teaching is. And, and relatively, it's based on the initiatic path. And so we'll talk more about that as we go on. But um, So we, we felt impulse to, to come up here and, and bring uh, this teaching here uh, because for each of us at, at points in our life, we came in contact with individuals that uh, were sacrificing at the time to bring Gnosis from, uh, from Mexico or, well, actually from Belize at that time because the, the Gnostic master, Samael Dior, uh, originally came from Colombia, and so this teaching was originally in uh, Spanish. And so when when we began, when I began, uh, the the books there were books, but not even translated in English. Very very few, and they were actually hand typed. I don't know if you remember what a typewriter with carbon copied, and that's that was my first book. Um, so it was so impacted, and then by applying the teachings transformed and feeling that then the the natural consequence was was uh, an impulse in our hearts to share that and to give that um, and it continued as we came up here with you guys now and as it tends to do it starts uh, small uh, it used to be I would make the joke that uh, we do have limits we do have you know guidelines and uh, one, one student is the, the max, the minimum. Any less than one, we don't give the class. <laughs> and I had another Gnostic teacher tell me, that's not, you should still give the class. Because there's somebody that's You're listening to Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so this is fine, this is great. It allows for intimacy, and that's where real understanding and comprehension can actually come. We're going to want to... I'm go we're going to try tonight. It's a little different, not for you guys, because, well, it's all different. This is the first time here. But a little different than what we're, we do. It's sort of going to try and be a little more fun, going to involve a lot of elements and things, uh, but uh, to engage. And we're going to talk about and, and, and connect a lot of aspects. Because you see in this, this glyph here, if you're familiar, the Tree of Life, and uh, you see the knight, and the maiden, and the king. And when we're covering mythology and psychology, and, and fundamentally the initiatic path, it incorporates many, many elements, many aspects of, of understanding. And I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say something that you may or may not accept or believe. But pretty much all mythology, all um, forms of spiritual teaching, in their essence, in their core, have the initiatic path. But that does not mean that everybody contacts the initiatic path. Because the initiatic path, though, is for every soul, it's not given to everyone. Because one that receives it has to want it from inside themselves. They have to yearn for it. They have to to feel called to to meet it. And they then are tested and and proved and verified. This is the way life works in this way. We say, I want this. And then life says, are you sure you want it? Yes, I do. And then circumstances shift. And then we say, do we want it in this environment? Do we want it in this way? Do we want it um, if it means that we have to change our job? If it means that we have to move? If it means all of these elements? So that we can continue to say yes, 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 and prove and crystallize inside of ourselves an element that is the fundamental component that I wanted to talk about tonight is will, or willpower 
and the necessity of will. For instance, in Christianity, the central core, well, one of the central cores in the beginning is the presence of free will. To have free will. Because without free will, I had this conversation with somebody once, why didn't God, if there is a God, make a universe or a creation where everything's blissful and happy and everybody's happy all the time? And my question to that individual is, how do you know he didn't when you chose not to be there? Or couldn't maintain the state of awareness to be there? We have to say yes, 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 continually, inside of ourselves. But we have to understand what it is that we're saying yes to, and how. And so the Gnostic teachings help to formulate that. And so in that the initiatic path is an aspect or the core of religious teachings, spiritual teachings, which includes mythologies and folklore, um, then that means that much of what we read, what we study, what we've heard about for time and time again, is more or less an educated guess. Because very few people are actually walking and living the initiatic path. And because of that, it gets very interesting. So when we're speaking of this topic, we can say that there are two types of esotericists, or two types of individuals that practice and study uh, the philosophy of awakening in the initiatic path. The first is intellectual, and learns and memorizes and, and compares and contrasts. And the second is intuitional, that actually working to, to live and understand that. And so, if you've done any study with mythologies and teachings and, and religions, and, and in depth, you start to realize, like if you were to Google any character of the Greek pantheon, you'll get, was born here, this time, this place, these parents, also, these parents, this situation, these circumstances, and the mind will go round and round in circles. So, of course, the intellectual that's not an esotericist says, oh, well, that's, it's all garbage. It's, all, it's just made up stuff because it contradicts itself all the time. But all of these teachings were not meant to be historical records. They're teachings to document internal processes that begin then as stories, come legends, and then myths. And we could say that it's the same story being told in different places and times, but I would say that it's actually a different story, but with the same core elements. And that is why the beauty, the truth doesn't evolve, these teachings don't evolve, but they are revealed more in complexity and dimension as they go on. So that you see, when you understand that when we're speaking of mythology, and we're speaking of gods, goddesses, in one sense, they do represent the intelligence of cosmic forces, and they represent these divine um, beings. But in a more practical, and I would say important sense, they represent aspects of the own, our own human consciousness, the heights and the depths qualities, virtues, values. And so once we start to understand that these represent values, then we can see intuitionally how they, this creation applies to this creation. And then at this point, it becomes this other element. Intellectually, the mind goes around and around and around. But internally, we can start to see the relationship in that. And so a key component is understanding the human psyche, our own. And so the course that we're going to give in the fall is, is the course of Dream Yoga, where we're going to really push as a group, as individuals, 
to awaken our consciousness to communicate with our own internal divinity through our own psychology and the elements of our psychology. Because the language of mythology, the language of parables, the language of religion is the language of the human consciousness. And it's always a representation of that human individual consciousness in communication with its own divine aspect. We don't say that I am God. That, that's ludicrous because if that were the case, things would be totally different here. But I am a part of God. Just like DNA will tell you that you have the complete structure within your fingernail of a whole Jeffrey. But it would be absurd for that fingernail to say, I am Jeffrey. But in potential, that fingernail is Jeffrey. So in essence, as a consciousness, we are that. The path of initiation is awakening to that, verifying that, living that. Now, this is what religion ultimately is. When we hear that word religion, some of us go, you know, but, but it comes from the Latin religare, which means re, again, and lig, like a ligament, to unite. So religion is to unite again, to reunite with that source which we came from. In the East, and what we're going to talk about tomorrow, which I advise you to come if you can tomorrow, the, the class that we're going to have tomorrow morning, the uh, Gnostic Yoga. Yoga is a word of the East that means the same thing. It comes from the root yug, which means to unite, like to yoke, like imagine two oxen with the yoke across them, to unite them. So yoga means to unite, religion means to reunite with that source, with that deep understanding of, of where we came from. And in that, we get to know where we're going. So we could say, that is the great trick of the magician, the great magic trick, is to, to manifest, to make appear these superior qualities in matter. To manipulate matter by bringing about these superior qualities. Now, like with any great magic trick, how does it how does it almost always begin a great magic trick? The big ones. Like you know, imagine there's a magician and you go there's an and there's an audience. There's a deception. There's a deception, okay. Misdirection actually. There's a misdirection, but before that well, but before that <laughs> there's a volunteer. <laughs> A volunteer is asked for. And that word volun comes from Latin, which means will. That someone must willingly participate. So in order for a magician to do the work that's required, there must be a willing participant. And in relation to the initiatic path, the individual needs to have that context in their mind, a willingness, a purpose. So as we're here tonight, we probably each come with our own purpose. We came with a purpose. So when you're, you know, there's always at least a trinity of elements brought together when something's created. There's your perception, there's our perception, my perception, and then there's the reality, right? Creation takes place, manifestation always takes place in Trinity. So you'll see as we talk tonight, a lot of Trinities. And so you start to realize the relationship of Trinities and what they abs absolutely mean, what they relatively mean. So, um, so in this, there's a purpose that we're here giving, talking, why we're here in this country, why we're here tonight, why I'm giving this class. There's a purpose why you came, but that purpose also may be, have a big component and a small component. It may be curiosity, it may be um, happenstance. We had a, an individual just walk by that belongs to another Gnostic group that we know of, and they just said, 
they saw the sign and they were like, what? And so we were talking to them. So, um, and so, and then in your purpose, you know, there's the intention that's here. There's your wish. There's your capacity for, to fulfill that purpose. But there's also the actual fulfilling of that purpose relative to uh, how you engage. And so what I ask as we go through this, to be aware of your purpose. Hopefully we're going to have some fun, we'll laugh, we'll see some nice images, I hope. Um, and uh, But always keep in mind your purpose. It's a question, and this is connects us with something that is core in the dream yoga process, is why am I here? Where am I? And why am I here? Because to live intuitionally, it's not always, we're not always where we are because of why we think. There's a lot of components here, and we're going to talk about it for a moment, but first, we're going to go back to a volunteer. A volunteer? Okay, great. Um, this is one of many new things I, I it came to me. Because one of, the, one of the elements of spiritual truths, right, they're abstract. They're, they're multidimensional. They're complex. And the difficulty has always been to communicate with elements of, of matter and physical symbols, and which is why tonight we're gonna, I'm gonna draw from all sorts of traditions, all sorts of elements, and forgive me, and, I, and this I'm gonna ask at the end feedback because I'm not going to explain most of them in depth because that, that then, then the whole portion is towards that. But I'm going to touch on them and show the relationships that helps to bridge gaps. What I think is amazing when we hear religious teachings and for some people or spiritual teachings, I'm not going to keep using that religious word because I'm not sure how everybody likes that, but, but since I told you how, how we, the context we mean, but that that people, you know, you see similarities, striking similarities, and, 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 and some people say, well, it's different because of this or it's different because of that, so it's not the same. Because we have this sense inside of our, ourselves always that I'm different, we're different. Us and them. Me and you. I believe this. Let me tell you what I think. Here's what my experience was. And so, because of that, we separate ourselves. And the beauty, when we start to expand our awareness to open ideas, but at the same time, fine-tune our attention to our purpose, then it's not about right or wrong, yours or mine. Is It's about, is this drawing me towards the fulfillment of my purpose, or is it taking me backward? And the only way that you can know that is yourself, inside yourself, in the moment. So we have to be present and be aware. But the element that's beautiful about that is that when we see the similarities and we put the similarities together, the differences start to, to bridge the gap if we're open and communicate to the consciousness. Because we're being questioned, we're being tested with our beliefs, with our understanding continually. But these spiritual truths are so fundamentally profound that intellectually, the intellect actually gets in the way of, of taking in this information. And many times in esoteric teachings, we can get so connected that we create a whole belief system and concept that we can never escape from. So it's beautiful to continue to start again. But what I wanted to illustrate the difficulty of conveying spiritual truths with uh, physical symbols and elements. Because people say things like, and 
I'll, I'll use an example where you say it with God, but I, I like to use extraterrestrials for some reason. You hear people say this, well, if it, extraterrestrials existed, why don't they just come down and land right on the White House lawn? Sorry, I got that's number one, first one. I gotta stop. Feedback? Yeah. Okay, it's gonna take a while. I'm aerocentrism. Okay. As someone said, I'm an inhabitant of the world. But anyway, um, or the universe. Um, but anyway, why don't they just land right here and say, here we are? That the Spanish conquistadors stop at every ant hill they came across? Exactly. 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 We we want superior beings to think like us, to go to the common, lowest common denominator. And when you do that, it removes the profundity. So, so in relation to mythology, what's always been interesting is there were two elements. There was the exoteric element, where um, the God, the forces, and these attributes and qualities were personified to make them accessible to you and I. But once we begin to realize that there's got to be something more here, then the initiatic path would be opened. And what would happen is they would take them generally into um, to some secluded area, change their whole structure and environment, and, and slowly introduce them to the symbols, but more so to their own consciousness and how to utilize the consciousness to acquire the truth. For instance, uh, there's this famous discourse by the Buddha. It's called the, uh, the Discourse of the, the, the Lotus or the Flower, something like that. And it was like a thousand people there, and he stood up and held up one flower and said nothing. It was, yeah, I don't think it was a lotus actually, but it was a flower. We can call it a lotus. A lotus stuff. Right. But that was his whole discourse. He said nothing. And one of his students cracked a smile. And the Buddha understood that he understood what he was saying. Now, what he was saying was only communicated intuitionally through that symbol. Like, look at this. But, but what is this? <laughs> it's a box. It's a box. a square stone. square stone. It's square. It's green. It's wood. It's a table. It's a seat. It's big in relation to something. It's small in relation to something else. In that one symbol is a million different answers, depending on what the question is that we're asking. That is true with everything we experience. This is a formation. It's a formation of knowledge. But that knowledge is all of that. We would say that it, this is knowledge in formation, or it's information. We all receive a talk, a teaching, a bus, a fan, as information that contains knowledge. It is up to the individual to extract the knowledge out. There's the absolute knowledge, but there's the relative knowledge to what I'm seeking. What is my question? What is my purpose in this moment? It's going to help me understand. I need to know what it is I'm asking and who I am that's asking it. So, we're going to try to convey something. All right. Step up here. It sounds like uh, how do you explain the mind? How do you explain the mm -hmm. Right. Because it's the absence. Exactly, and yet books upon books upon books upon books upon books are written about them, and, and information is conveyed. So, I'm going to ask He 
is a willing participant. Huh? Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you you could start to guess for for during time. What what is he showing you? New type of change. It's not stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Ever changing. Yes. Here, do you need some more sticks? No, I need square sticks or any other sticks. I read something funny. Oh, I said Jinger. Recently, it was uh, the, the trees that were cut to make Jenga blocks right? mm-hmm. are doomed to relive their <laughs> That's beautiful. Aha! <laughs> uh-huh. so that, there you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. What, what, what is this? I was I was going for the peace sign. That's pretty good. No, I was just uh, I was I was originally trying to make a uh, 12 point 12 foot wheel, but they just went stacking that way. So I made the hockey one, and as I was staring at it, I was thinking, wait, hold on, and then cube. So first you said cube, and then I was thinking, well, the negative space thereof, because you said absence or something is for the absence of that uh, almost just a cube if you have those three more. See, that's just a three dimensional view. Oh, look, I do see the cube here. Yeah, that's for the one in the back of Right, but you were, I was originally going for a 12 spoke wheel. Right, but to, to <laughs> convey love. Yeah. Love. So so my, my my point really is that's a beautiful cube. That's a great job. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> but you see, to explain something so complex and abstract, with simple matter, simple elements. Now, imagine if we had a million, billion, trillion sticks and pulled back big enough, we could create a reality, a structure that in that one could, if they were capable and if they wanted and were willing, willing, could experience that. I find that that's interesting that we think that we can read a book, we think that we can hear a talk, see an image, and capture the deep significance of something so profound. This is why, very interestingly, the symbols have been given again and again and and revealed and, and communicated and the teachings adapt and adjust but they don't destroy the past. They, they complement and, and move forward. For instance, have you ever noticed that it's very interesting, and I'm going to use a lot of uh, Greek artwork or, or Greek uh, images to talk about uh, the Greek mythology, painted by Christian painters in the Renaissance. Did you ever think about that? But that doesn't... That doesn't uh, if you really think about it, it doesn't seem weird that, that you go into great cathedrals and see depictions of mythology. And the same paintings, painters that are painting crucifixions are also painting uh, Prometheus being chained to a stone. Because they're conveying qualities and values. But the teachings are the same. And the beauty of the esoteric path has been the introduction through art and symbolism, through poetry, through music, because the need to communicate these superior principles takes a very artful communication. But even more so, it takes a willing participant to receive that. Otherwise, it's... 
I've heard this before. We we, we travel. We get to travel a lot through the Gnostic teachings, going to different retreats and events, and, and we have been very fortunate to spend time in very old cities and go to ancient cathedrals and ancient. For instance, we even saw a uh, Mithraic um, temple underneath a Christian church, an early Christian church underneath a Catholic church. Mm-hmm. So we've had the, the ability to see these things and, and, and some people go, yeah, it's a church, I've been to a hundred of them. We, we love churches, cathedrals, because the teaching in stone, in art, and the communication through the architecture really impacts the individual. We would say that they're they're a superior formation to impact the consciousness. Coupled with years upon years upon willing individuals praying and sacrificing for that purpose. You feel it. If you're willing, if you want to feel it, you, you can go lots of places and not feel it. But you can create that space inside your own home too. But first, you have to create it inside yourself. And you have to make sure that that place is kept uh, free from external impulse that, that can destroy that. But we also have to have um, the element of light to come in. So in this depiction, we, if you're familiar or not, this is the tree of life, and we'll show it again composed of ten sephiros to represent creation. And there's a reflection ten sephiros before. This was just an artful depiction that, that I put together. But something very interesting here, there's a mysterious sephira in the center that's called in Hebrew, da'at. Which means knowledge. In Greek, that word is gnosis. Uh, I didn't just ask a question, not to Hopefully not to derail. Why is there ten spheres? I'm familiar with the importance of nine and a lot of different spheres of thought, but mm-hmm. what's the ten? I'm not familiar at all with Kabbalistic stuff. Right. I, in in, in Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil is is nine nine spheres, right? Um, yes, because the lower sphere Malkuth is fallen and it's separated itself. Which is the sphere that we all live in. Mm-hmm. Very, uh, very succinct way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's something interesting. We're going to have fun, have a good time. But Gnosis actually, in time, deals with some very serious, kind of hard to process issues sometimes. Because we think, I, you know, everything that's brought me to this point has brought me here. And I'm here to receive this teaching for a moment or for a, a, a year or a week or whatever that is. But in order, but the elements that bring us here are not the actual elements that propel us to move forward. We think, we think in our minds that I have these acquisitions, these things in life, these teachings, and now I just want to add this without understanding that the reason we don't have this great spiritual realization, living in a great state of consciousness, is because the very elements in the way that I perceive and and deal with myself and and situations. Which means we only have to change one thing to really process and, and move forward. And that one thing is everything. But the beauty is we don't have to change all the elements arrange them in a better way. We don't need to change this thought for that thought. I don't need to start, stop thinking about disco. I don't know why I was, it was at the restaurant. Disco. And start thinking about classical. And, and stop, you know, drinking alcohol and start drinking um, ambrosia. Or, you know, whatever that is. We don't change this thought for that thought. We have to change the thinker. We have to change our attachment. Because many times we go through life and, and remove, just like I was saying, the teachings are additive. Where you see dogmatic teachings, you see individuals destroying, going into an area and destroying what was there. 
it's very interesting. The conquistadors was talked about, and there's a we could talk at, at length about the ancient civilizations of the Maya, the Aztecs, um, the um, the Iwakos, and, and the different uh, individuals that actually say to themselves, "We are a non-fallen race." That when the conquistadors came. They just re- they didn't fight. They just retreated back into the jungles, and they stayed untouched for thousands of years. And eventually, started coming out to communicate because they understood that the, the, the what we've done to the world, and felt they needed to speak out. But the conquistadors came, and they built their structures and did their stuff. And of course, they they went back to where they came from. And then the the, the indigenous people came back out, and they took it all down except for one big cross. They left the cross because they understood the significance of the cross. And it has a very deep significance. And it it relates to something that we're going to talk about tonight in different ways. So first, I was showing you this window, which was behind Da'at, Gnosis, which is knowledge, but it's a particular type of knowledge. It is Knowledge of direct, intuitive experience. Someone was asking me about, well, what is the term Gnostics, and when people came, where did Gnostic come from? And we usually think of agnostics who not know, but a Gnostic is one who knows or seeks to know. And the, the individuals didn't call themselves Gnostics, but they were in this pursuit for Gnosis, the knowledge that has the power to transform, to create. So Gnosis is transformative. So two things we would like to touch on here is that one, the basic, this is Gnosis, Gnosis 101. We've, you know, in our 20 years of teaching, have given that talk a hundred times or introduced. Gnosis is knowledge of direct experience. Gnosis is... Um, what we teach, and this is all these different topics based on the Gnostic teachings. But more importantly, what we would like to convey is what Gnosis is and the ability to acquire it. Because what is missing from all the art and the ancient teachings and the techniques and even the Gnostic writings and the Gnostic books was the commentary, the communication of the masters that were living that teaching at that time. They were esoteric teachings, so you have to understand that you will never receive the teaching from the written word. It's only its exoteric representation. It's only the sticks that are left behind. It is the human consciousness that conveys that teaching. Not by just someone that Jeffrey and Judith that came here and said, hey, you know, I'm going to put some pictures together and we're going to do a class and we're going to communicate. That has no value. This is based on a teaching, on a lineage that's gone back as long as there's been human individuals. There's been a Gnostic teaching of some form, an initiatic path. And that this teaching only has value because of the masters that have realized, self-realized, realized those qualities of the, of the gods and goddesses inside themselves. Because that's the second element of the mythology. The first is personifying these aspects so that I can relate to them. So I can put this icon here and worship and pray to, right? So that my crops will grow and all these elements. But the real esoteric or inner teaching is to abstract the consciousness to communicate, to reach to the superior dimensions. And that is where Gnosis lives. Gnosis cannot just come to me. I have to willingly go to it. So if we see this castle as the individual, and we turn it around and we're on the inside now. We are in this dark, dark place of our thoughts and our feelings and our memories and our prejudices. But 
the light of creation is always coming through. There's always that window, the possibility. But we have to understand how, how to extract the gnosis, the wisdom, from the formation, the formation, from the thought, from the feeling. Because we, in teachings, the light is spoken about all the time. I want to see the light. I want to be one with the light. I want to crystallize the light. Zeus, right? His symbol was, is lightning. And that's a symbol of many of the divinities, especially the father archetype. But the light comes from this window, but staring at the window is not the important thing. It's important, but it's not the important thing. What's important is what that light can illuminate that's inside. The elements that obscure me from seeing the reality. So, the first step in, in acquiring gnosis or knowledge of this type requires three steps. The Gnostic Master somehow else says obligatory steps. We need these three steps to to acquire gnosis, knowledge. The first is imagination. The second is inspiration. And the third is intuition. Now, right now, see an apple. Did you do it? A little bit? And then what happened right after that? A car? God. God? God? God. Oh, good. Oh, gone. Gone. Right. So, First, to struggle with the imagination, the ability to see. But in life, that ability, it represents all perception, the senses, to see. Because we know, the science tells us, that we're not actually seeing things as they are. The light is bouncing off of them, going into us, and we're recreating it back inside of ourselves. The, the other very weird anomaly, for instance, you say, this cup is black, right? But the way light works and color works is actually it is every other color but black. So it's reflecting back black because it can't absorb that. That's a bizarre anomaly that indicates to us that already we're not seeing things as they are. We're seeing things as we think they are. Now then, what does black mean to me? What does coffee mean to me? What does this little person, what's he, he about? You know, all of these other things, you notice when we try to focus our attention to see something, the intellect always communicates. There's a, 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 a Gnostic master, Zoroaster, who, said, who quotes, I guess he quotes this from, from the Gnostic teachers, he says that intuition is a particular apprehension of knowledge without the depressing function of reasoning. Wow, that sounds a little like what? <laughs> no. but, but when we start to try to quiet our mind, to, to reach that first level of gnosis, which is imagination, what do we see? Black. Blackness. Generally, that's what happens or it's changing. And and then I start to see something, and if we will learn this in Dream Yoga, how to work with this threshold of awake and asleep, but the intellect comes in and communicates and, and labels and names and narrates all of our experience. Now, that in itself is bad enough. Then that narration becomes an interpretation. How often do you notice, you say, oh, that person... They don't care about this. Just look how they, they just threw that piece of trash on the ground. And then we interpret that. And we might even go, oh, their parents, their parents must have been terrible. Or, you know, I'm, I'm just making, I, I know if we go inside for a moment, we can see ourselves doing that. Not only are we narrating with our intellect what's happening, what we see, and say this is black, when science tells us it's actually not black, it's every kind of but black, but we seems believing, right? So so we do that. Then we interpret what it is. Oh, that's a, that person's a coffee drinker. Or, you know, well, that person's drinking out of a, a, a paper cup. They don't care about the planet. You know, what, whatever that is, we start to 
interpret, judge. And that takes us out of the first step. We're not able to get that first step of Gnosis because we're not able to see things clearly, hear things clearly. So this is a practice to do from moment to moment, but in meditation as well. Now the next is to use that attention. So in the darkness, if we're seated in the darkness inside of ourselves, and we're looking into the darkness, and we're trying to imagine something. Now, when I say imagine, it's not to make something up. There's a confusion about that. To imagine is to actually see. But in order to see, we have to quiet the mind enough so that we can see what's here that we're not seeing. And there's two components of that. One is looking. And looking. Looking. Looking, looking, looking. Right? And then there's seeing. I kind of screwed this up for myself. I said that this isn't a gold bowl because it's gold. But, but my point is that I don't have to look to see that it's a bowl. I just see it. So in the practice... We have to oscillate between looking and seeing. Because that connects us to two great elements. Attention with awareness. Because like this box has many different uh, definitions. It depends on the context. Whatever I see, I'm always seeing in context. That is what creation is. It's a contextual relationship. We are here because of relationships. And in those relationships, the path is revealed. I want to love, but this guy's really pissing me off. I I want to love, or, or hey, you know, I'm trying to love here, but could you close your mouth when you eat? Chew, because it's really making it hard for me to love when I'm seeing the food coming out of it. You can find all these elements for ourselves, right? That there's a context that this that I'm seeing, that I'm looking at, is an environment. So the first two steps are seeing and being aware of myself in an environment seen. And the key component in that is a willingness to see. That is the key of will. Because if I don't want to see, it's not like I want to see a unicorn. No. But I want to see. It's a receptivity. So to perceive and receive. And trying to hold that. It's a trinity that produces comprehension because the third force is the intuition the lightning that flashes so the real talk title of this talk is the hero's yearning probably heard of the hero's journey but it's the hero's yearning because the hero needs to yearn needs to want to know that is fundamental and it's not I just, I, I, I want to know so bad that I will do anything. No, that's attachment. That's desire. And so next week, we're going to look at desire. This week, we're looking at will. Because for the hero, for a hero, it's the band. Yeah. Right, well, you can already turn it off. Directly on me. Oh. There, there you go. <laughs> but I'm going to be blocking. So. Either way. Yeah. If it needs to go off for a bit, it can go off. So. But in the teachings, okay. mythology, especially Greek mythology, but in the Norse mythology too, is the story of heroes. And there are two types. There's the hero that fights for honor, that fights for his name, that fights for respect, that fights for vengeance, that fights for himself. 
for herself. And then there's the hero that fights for the divine, that fights for a higher purpose. So, for instance, we're going to look at Achilles next week, and maybe down the line, here's, I'm going to be honest with you, I put this course together, and I thought we're going to talk about this, with folklore, and I'm going to, maybe the Little Mermaid, some some uh, fairy tales and different things, because I, I wanted to, to get into some of that, but I left it open, because I'm, there's so much that can be talked about, and I want to be synthetic, s- synthesized, and be purposeful. But you're going to find, we're going to talk about some interesting things. I can't exactly tell you, because then I have to be conformed to that, but there's some very interesting stuff that we're going to talk about. But next week, it will be Achilles and the Fall of Troy, the Trojan War. Very beautiful, eloquent, eloquent communication through that. Um, but you have to understand, we have to look at the great picture and all the aspects and facets and look at ourselves. And so, Achilles fights for himself, fights for his honor, for his own name, for revenge, for vengeance. Hercules, or Heracles, the Greek version, is a hero, and, and it's in his name. Hera fights for the goddess, the great divine mother Hera. Because if Zeus, in this is the father of the gods. Hera is the divine mother of the gods, or of all creation, divine matter. And she represents all the symbols and the forces that the hero must fight or struggle against to crystallize those virtues and and forces inside themselves. But the beauty of these mythologies is there is no one absolute symbol that has one absolute meaning. Because we're talking about huge, immense, complex, but simple ideas. So all of the divinities and all of the the elements represent and mean different things. Someone said, what does this person represent? Well, it represents this. What does it represent to you? And in this moment, and in that moment. Um, so you can see this is a slight depiction here, this is Thor, right? Battling the giant. He battled giants. He battled the the Midgard serpent that that, uh, has a a really beautiful mythology, which I thought I was going to talk about, but we're not going to talk about it. We don't have time for that. But but what we are going to talk about, the subtext of this class, is Thelema, the hammer of the gods. We've been talking about Thelema already. It's a Greek word. And and it essentially means will, to want, to wish, purpose. We, We get confused when we think of will or willpower often as a force. I need willpower to overcome this situation, this circumstance. That is a weak will. What we need is willingness to be in this situation and allow that thing to be. Because in that we start to divide our attention and have the perception and the reception of how I'm receiving and allowing this thing to be and me willing to be here. Notice, and we're going to give this as an exercise for the week if we come back next week, and I'm going to give you the exercise now because we can do it continually. We can do it with this class. But but to pick a mundane task like sweeping or paying the bills or whatever that, that thing may be for you and do it willingly. And notice the depressing function of the intellect that wants to tell you where you could be, what you could be doing, how upsetting this is, how beneath you this is. Why do I always have to clean up? Why can't somebody else pick up after themselves? Why all of these things? Willingness connects us with the joy 
of doing instead of desire, which attaches itself with an objective or outcome. And you might think, well, yeah, there's certain tasks I just want to get done. But in that, we lose our will. The power to be. Willingness to be. That is what the lemma is. And maybe you've heard that phrase before. It was made esoterically popular by Aleister Crowley and such and such. And we're going to talk about that for a bit. But but it's, a, it's an ancient word from the Greek that means will. And that a very profound symbol, one of the elements of that symbol is this hammer of Thor. Now, that's just one aspect of what this symbol represents because the beautiful thing is, I mean, what do we know about Thor's hammer? One thing. Always returns. Always returns. You throw it and it comes back. That's a very powerful element. It can... Change size. Change size. It can destroy anything that it touches, material. Only he can wield it. Only he can wield it. And he actually has to wear special gloves when he does it. But that's another... We we can't go into all of that. But one other element that we don't normally think of, it also has the power of creation and healing. And actually, in the ancient traditions... If I'm not mistaken, it's what resurrects his goats every day, correct? There we go. I got an image of, of his goats a little down the line. We'll see if we get to that. But um, but it was it was held in, in, in reverence, like the cross for the Christians, because it actually is a symbol of the cross. And it's a symbol because it, it is composed of two elements intersecting. And it has the power to destroy and the power to heal. And that it was, in the ancient times, it was used as a symbol at, uh, when there was a birth, they would bring the, the hammer, the symbol of the hammer out to, to make the, to consecrate this element. A marriage, a wedding, the individuals would sit and they would put the hammer on their lap. With the piece between the legs. Because it had the, the power of consecrating and sanctifying their union. Those are things we don't generally know about the Thor's hammer. You don't get that in the Marvel version. Well, you build things with the hammer. Yes. So build them. Absolutely. And so that's. You didn't have a large selection of tools, like very. Right. But but the most important thing, in all that it represents, it had the the power, like we saw in this other slide, to bring the lightning, to illuminate. To bring the, the force. And something interesting about the hammer, I don't know if you guys know this, I've worked in construction for, for many, many years, and that, the ha- but that you can magnetize elements by striking them with a hammer. Aligning, for instance, a screwdriver, they have these grabbing screwdrivers to hold screws if you need before they have magnetic tips. And um, But if in a pinch... You could take your screwdriver, align it north, and beat on it with a hammer, and it would it would temporarily align the magnetic poles to then create attraction. That's very that's pretty cool, right? It's also a tool that creates more of itself. <laughs> yes. If you're magnetizing a piece of metal, mm-hmm. you tap it, it magnetizes. Ah, there you go. There you go. So the power of the hammer has the ability to change relationships. That is the human will. It's a symbol of the human will. It's it's that Thor has the ability to utilize this hammer. But not only Thor. It has another very, uh, some other very interesting uh, characters. One, in relation to Hera, the goddess. Now, interesting, her name, Hera, like I said, Heracles meant um, Hera's glory. That's where his name comes from. And then in the Roman tradition, Hercules. We generally think of Hercules, but the original is Heracles. And she was giving him all sorts of havoc because he needed to perfect him himself, purify himself, absolve himself through these tasks of purification. 
He didn't curse her. He did it willingly because he knew that they were, what his purpose was. The purpose of a hammer, for instance, can accomplish miracles. But no matter how great the hammer is, it's not going to drive screws very well. So we have to have our intelligence to understand what tool we need at what time and what what amount to, to, to use. Uh, so we think of Hera as mother of the gods, Zeus's wife. But interestingly, before they were together, and, and if you look at this, there's these cycles of cor- formations where this God does this thing to this person before they're born, and then they do it here after they're born. And it's it, the intellect can go crazy. We have to understand attention with awareness and pull back and feel inside of ourselves what the quality that's trying to be conveyed. And because of that, we need to draw from different traditions. We need to draw from different um, information. So, interestingly. Before Hera, Zeus's first wife was Metis. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the relation of Metis. Metis means uh, mind or thought, but really what it means is magical cunning. And she becomes the mother of wisdom, the goddess Athena. But it's a very interesting story that we're going to communicate and how this interplays and leads into next week's class. Hera represents the divine goddess, which is not just a goddess, but the feminine aspect of divinity that is inside each and every one of us. One of the very wonderfully impactful elements that the Gnostic teachings has revealed is not that um, God is androgynous, both male and female, and, and the Gnostic master, somebody else says, Anyone that believes God as a male is half of an atheist. Because God is androgynous. God is beyond masculinity. God is masculine and feminine. So, God is feminine as well. So, both Zeus and Hera are aspects of our own divine consciousness. What was conveyed more profoundly is that each of us has our own intimate divine mother. And to begin on the path of initiation, to begin on the path of initiation, we have to connect to our own intimate divine mother to give birth to that hero inside of ourselves. Because she represents matter, the Latin word mother, mater, matrix, womb, which is matrice, matter, is mother, is feminine nature, where the spirit counterpart, the active principle is masculine, and that all expression of creation is both male and female, continually giving and receiving. And that's some of the aspects of the tree of life that we'll we'll get into in, in future time. But understanding that then she, being this cosmic representation of all femininity and all receptivity, has different aspects. And in the Gnostic teachings it said that there's generally five aspects of the Divine Mother. We're not going to go into all of those, we're just going to look at her in the first form of cosmic, but it's very interesting that the name, Hera, same root for hero, the same root for eros, which is love that a hero is a lover because they're fighting for love. And that and that root, Hera, becomes Hierophant, which we're going to utilize some of the cards of the Tarot. We're not going to go in depth, but we will in time because the Tarot is the steps of the initiatic path. It's not something primarily to ascertain who I'm going to fall in love with and what what should I wear tomorrow. It is a communication mathematically, symbolically, of the initiatic path. And we'll we'll talk about some elements of that 
But I thought this was very interesting because Hera, Herofin, the card Herofin, the five, which is the Hebrew letter He, which is the representation of the feminine womb, where birth takes place, you see the god Anubis, who's the judge of karma, the main judge of karma, the ruler of karma. And that he has in his right hand, just like Hera has here, the staff. And he's stepping forward with his right foot. She's stepping forward in feminine nature with her left foot. And through um, the next wife of Zeus, the first wife is Methis. And it's very interesting because she was a titan and she helped him get away from the tyranny of her father who was eating all of their children. You know that story. And she helped them to overcome uh, the titans. But, so because of that, he, t- he fell in love with her, but he couldn't actually have her as he wanted because he had found out that her, her, her offspring were going to, the, the son was going to be greater than the father. And that's a consistent thing that happens throughout these teachings. And we'll talk about the offspring of these two. But what I wanted to talk about just briefly is the next wife of Zeus is Themis. And we'll talk about her in a little bit. But in in the relationship of Themis, five feminine trinities were born of that creation. And it's illustrating, if once we understand the Torah, what five represents the order and the structure or the um, effect where the masculine represents the causal factor, the feminine represents the effect. Spirit matter. So t- to have that magical influence upon matter, we need to connect with the, with the, the cause. Otherwise, we're changing, we're trying to continually change our material world around, but without changing causes inside of ourselves, it's always going to restructure in the same pattern so that I can learn, so that I can acquire the knowledge that I need to really free myself. And this is ruled by the the card number five of the Tarot. But it's very interesting that there are five trinities that come from this birth. One that we'll talk about is the fates. So the first is, the first of this this union of uh, Pemis with Zeus is the, uh, the three hours, they're called, or the, the three seasons, that represent nature and time. Then come the three um, graces, which represent all the benefits that can come from life. Then the, the three furies. From that are all the retribution and difficulties of life. Next, the three fates that represent the life of the individual you and I ourselves. The three of them. Um, one, one spins the thread, one measures the thread, and one cuts the thread. And that thread represents our life. That from the union of the divine principle of Zeus inside the severe dimensions, we are born into this construct of this five elements of structure of a life that has nature, time, cause and effect, benefits, detriments, and a defined period of time. And she waits to cut that thread. What a job that would be. (laughs) You need to have willingness to do that. And what comes from all of this is the ability for us to realize the mechanicity, the beauty, the complexity, and the simplicity of life. But we can only really ascertain that by wanting to know what is our purpose. If I was born a hammer, back to that analogy, everything to me is going to be a nail. And no matter how wonderful the the hammer, if it's used to drive screws in, it's never going to be as happy. It's never going to be fulfilled. 
the hammer's going to say, I'll get that screw in, bam! But the thrill, and there's actually a thrill of driving a nail in. I, there's an art to it, because you can hit, and it bends. You did a little bit of that, didn't you? And once that nail bends, it gets hard, but man, when you line the nail up, and you hit it perfectly, and it just, boom! You transfer the force of your will into a structure to build something. It's wonderful. So for us to understand what is our purpose as an individual? What is your purpose for being here? And I'm and, and in this moment with my awareness and my attention and my moving forward or moving back. So in this, there is a creation long before the gods. That there was only darkness, night, chaos. And then an egg was fecundated. And that egg held, when cracked, Phanus, which was the light bringer, the bringer of light, who in turn became Eros. Actually, Eros and Phanos are the same creatures, the same entities that were there before any of the gods. Light. Light comes into the world before any creation takes place. But what's wonderful that this form of Eros, which we generally think of Eros Cupid, right? The simple little guy with the arrows. Interestingly, Eros has the arrows like Thor's hammer that has the ability he's got two arrows one creates attraction the other creates disdain he has the power in the capacities of the god love Eros the capacity for love or hate and how our will is related to that because Eros represents a part of our own consciousness and here we see in this depiction of Eros looks like someone very familiar to us. Does anyone know who that looks like? Lucifer. Lucifer. Prometheus. And we're going to give a talk on Lucifer, but a fun one. That one's going to be very fun. Um, but here you see he's chained to stone and it's because of his fall, because how did he fall, Lucifer, in the Bible? Anybody remember? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm pretty. I'm kind of a geek, Bible geek kind of guy. He to Adam. Is that what it is? Well, yeah, he, he wanted to be wiser, to be to ascend above God, to ascend. But because of that, what happened? He fell, and how did he fall? Head first down, was the floor. Like a lightning, he fell. It says it right in the Bible, like lightning. And the name Lucifer. In Latin, what does it mean? Luce, light, fur, fairy, to carry. Lucifer is the light bearer. He's got a bad rap. Depends who you have. And for wanting to, wanting to have more wisdom, more knowledge, he was cast down. This is an esoteric principle. Christ said it himself. Which God? Well, the, in the Bible, the statements are very short. Much of what we have is embellishment and understanding and fear. Actually, one of the popes had the name Lucifer way back away. Things transform into elements that, that we then say, oh, Lucifer's this. Because Lucifer is actually also an aspect of our own consciousness. All of the angels, all of the divinities, all of the gods are part of ourself. And that I'll show some, some very interesting similarities in teachings that relate to this. But here you see he fell and lost his crown and broke his scepter. But what I was going to say is there's a principle, and, and Lucifer is known as the light bearer and is related to the planet Venus the bringer of the light, the morning star. Which Jesus is also related to the morning star. And in Greek there was there's two. There's Hesperos and Phosphoros. 
the light of the of the waning day and the light of the coming dawn. That star represents both. And so, Lucifer, the, the bringer of light, comes down. And we see in the story of Prometheus, who is the Greek Lucifer, brought knowledge, fire, to the human beings. And he brought, brought that fire in a reed. He stole it from the gods for love of humanity. And because of that, he was cast down and tied to a stone. So we'll, we'll get into that for a moment, but I think this is very interesting that we see in this artwork, Eros, which we generally think as desire, because Lucifer is, is the tempter. He doesn't make you do something. He shows you, look how beautiful this is. Even the story in the garden, he shows them the fruit and says, it will make you wise. And actually, he's the cunning, most cunning of, of creatures, it's said there. And the word actually in Hebrew, or, or the ancient Aramaic, for um, serpent is also sorcerer, magician. It's very interesting to go into depth and to study these things. But So because of that, and the fall of this light into creation, into the world, and the need of the great magician, which is the first card of the Tarot, the magician, the beginning of the path. And in this card, you see, he says, his left foot forward, his right foot back, his left hand with the wand reaching up into heaven, and his right hand pointing down. He's channeling the forces of, of the divine, into crystallization and manipulation of the matter. You saw it coming. To create a superior matter in the waters of creation. But I love this piece of art because you see this feminine uh, sorceress with her right hand down with a wand creating a circle to perform magic. And around her neck, is a serpent biting its tail. Because through the word of the individual, of the magician, is the power to transform eternity. And so that magician, who create, who, who appears like a lightning bolt, the letter Aleph, represents this descent of the light through the tree of life. But what happens in this, each of these spheres represent aspects of the consciousness. And without going into depth, I just wanted to, 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 to illustrate this relationship of this light evil, this crystallization of the light, reaches the, the aspect of the human soul or the human will. And how often... We receive something and we say, this isn't mine, I don't deserve this, I don't want this. The tasks that we go from moment to moment, our attention somewhere else. On the thing that we want to complete, on the thing that we want to do instead. And we don't have a willingness to be in the circumstances and the environment that we are. And so this sixth sphere from the top is the human soul, which is the sixth card of the Tarot, where you see this individual standing between a goddess and a an harlot. And he's got his hands crossed, he's walking one way, looking the other, he's, he's confused, he's in a hole. The choice, what to do, what to do in this moment. The calling of the hero, to stand up, to fight, to fight for what though? If I don't hear God inside of me, if I don't see or understand through the elements how can I what do I know what to fight for all of the great religions speak about a great war we're going to talk about that war next week in the in the war of uh, Troy which is was well, I don't want to get into it too much it's pretty interesting but but this great battle but for the initiate the individual the battle is always 
first and foremost against myself. To eliminate the elements of myself that cannot, will not, do not want to see what's right before me. Because it means that we're going to have to change elements in some of us. We say, no, 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 I just want. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. We want these wonderful experiences. We want to communicate with God. Just like the extraterrestrial. If God is there, why doesn't He just tell me exactly what He wants? Wouldn't that be simple? And then I'll do it. But the intellect is always going to interfere and doubt and confuse. The only true faculty of knowing is intuition, and it's like lightning and it's instantaneous. But still, after the fact, the intellect interferes and communicates. Oh, that wasn't real. That didn't really happen. Did that mean this or did that mean that? But in the moment, we know. We have to place ourselves in a position of knowing. Because when we don't, when we don't know as a hero of the path what it is we're supposed to do, and we think we change and perpetuate a downfalling of this light, and it then crystallizes in lower and lower spheres inside of ourselves, creating a gravitational pull that pulls us down further, further, and change us, chains us like Lucifer to that rock of the earth. Matter, material, the senses, materialism. So, to wrap up this relationship that takes place of the first wife, the first wife of Methus, who is the mother of Athena, the goddess of wisdom, something very interesting happens. Zeus is, a, is afraid that if he mates with Methus, the offspring will overthrow him. So he after um, connecting with her, he realizes, wow, I got caught up, and I need to pull back from that. But it was already too late. They had already conjoined. So he thought, well, how can I get out of this? He, he starts to trick her in, into saying, you can become anything, and he starts challenging her, become this animal, this, this, until he gets her down to a fly, and then a drop of water, and he swallows her. The way Zeus deals with things, it's like, okay, I got it. Done. <laughs> but so interestingly, Hera, who's up here, hears of Zeus mating with Metis, who's seated here on a dragon, and says, Well, Zeus is going to create without me. I'm going to create without him. And this is very similar to the Gnostic story of the fall of Sophia, who creates this demiurge god, Ioldabon, because she creates without her male counterpart. So Hera creates Hephaestus, who is deformed and has a clubbed foot. And so she sees how hideous he is and casts him from heaven. So here you see her throwing Hephaestus out, while Zeus is reaching towards Athena, who's on a, on a rock and supported by a tree. And Hephaestus goes down. Hephaestus, Vulcan in the Roman pantheon, has a very particular um, power. He um, falls into the abyss, just like that light. Because he's, he's um, disdained by his mother. And in the Gnostic, ancient Gnostic teachings, there's this creation of Eldabuth, and the moment that she's, he is created, his mother hides him and pushes him down into the earth, where he believes, I am God, there's no one greater than me here, and starts ruling over all of the world. In reality, he was cast out of, out of the superior dimensions. So this plays out in our own psychology with our own desire becoming our own God. That there's nothing more important in confusing our purpose with what we desire. 
But before Hephaestus goes down into the, the abyss, the forge of Vulcan, he lands on this rock and is raised by Tethys, who we'll talk about next week. But who is Tethys is the mother of Achilles, who's, who, who knows what's that one flaw that Achilles has? The heel, the foot. Very interesting that Hephaestus has a bad foot. And Hephaestus ends up, in time, cast out and into the underworld. And reaches a point, but is still a god. And there he goes to instruct the other artificers. And he becomes then the greatest builder and maker of all things. Anything that you read about in mythology, any great contraption, any spear, any shield, Hephaestus made it. The winged helmet and the wings of Mercury, Hephaestus made it. And he made it with the three tools that he has. The anvil, the tongs, and of course, the hammer. These are the three aspects of the consciousness or the human will. In order to build and construct anything, one has to have a stable place to put it on. One has to have the ability to reach into the fire in, from the elements and extract an element without getting burned and to be able to hold that element. So that then with the will of the hammer, we can bang out the kinks and make the element, make the sword, make the shield. But in order to hold it, we have to hold it lightly. Because if you ever hold something hard against something, it's got to be able to bounce. So those three aspects are the three, at one level, the aspects of the imagination, the ability to see something, inspiration, the willingness to see or to know what it is you're seeing, and the intuition, the understanding of how to apply it. That's what intuition is. To know something and to know what it means to you. And then it doesn't matter if somebody says, no, 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 that means this, because it has these attributes. No, but to me, it means this, and you know it. That's how the being, God, can communicate to you. We have to be able to receive, we have to put ourselves in a willing state to receive that. And so what happens is, in this circular motion, it's too late. Zeus has in his belly the already pregnant Methus. And it, it, it produces an immense headache. Have you heard the story? And so he's got this crazy headache. And fortunately, Hephaestus, and this is an axe, but, it, but really it's a hammer and you've got hammers all around. He releases the wisdom, the warrior princess wisdom from the head of Zeus. So, meanwhile, Hephaestus is being cast out of heaven because Zeus, you know, so there's these circular reasonings, but, but what's interesting, what I want to close with is, Hephaestus approaches Athena. He falls in love with her immediately. But she doesn't allow him to touch her because he has to go down into his element and work with the tools that he has to purify himself, to earn the love, to earn the ability to perceive gnosis or wisdom. Wisdom, viz, the root viz, vision, and dom, dominion. Wisdom is the power to see. Willingness is the power to be with what it is that we see to bear the negative manifestations of other people to bear the negative manifestations of ourselves we continue to not want to see those and we cast that hideous thing out and down and so it goes deeper and deeper away from ourselves until 
we, it, it, it is so overwhelming it overcomes us and it manifests in circumstances in our life through the relationship of the Divine Mother and this light that, that we hide away because light has to be revealed it will in time so we can either do it willingly or we do it unwillingly so the key for us to find our purpose I was going to talk about the runes a little bit but we're going to we're not going to talk about that but what we will do is a practice and what I will communicate about the runes they're an ancient uh, language that it said that all of our ancient languages come from Sanskrit Hebrew Chinese the ancient Nahuatl all come from this ancient Norse language and in this this uh, language we have uh, this origin from this letter which is known as the barred thorn which is the representation of the the earliest representation is called the barred thorn and I'll, I'll explain why this is because the is the definitive article of anything God said let there be light and the light was the simplest way of defining something Damus begins the um, Thetis, the Theos, the Telema, the because the is will, and in in the Norse that was symbolized with the th, the sound the, as the rune thorn, like in the word Thor. The three aspects of the consciousness: the will will and action and repentance reflecting back this is one aspect one aspect because these are ancient ancient well the fun one also is that thurs the thorn is the symbol for the frost giants which are unmanifest chaos and when it's unmanifest it's just a murky pool that you can thrust your hands into the clay and mold what you want from it right but but we have to be able to have the will with the tongs with the tongs <laughs> to do that. So we're going to do uh, uh, from the the Gnostic tradition the the rune thorn is a posture. All of the runes represent archetypical uh, um, bringing of forces together. And so the rune is done with the right hand for willpower on the hip. Very simple, just like this. Standing. Standing. And we we generally face the east. I don't know where the east rest is. is that way, east. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's do that. Broadway goes from east to west. Yeah. Uh, you can see the west. The mountains are to the north. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. oh, right. <laughs> I just couldn't see the mountains. Yeah, we see the mountains. So, so east is so this way. East is this way. But anyway, we'll, we'll work that. that east? Yeah, that's east. North. No, no, UBC so is over east. east. Okay. Okay. So. It's simple, and we're wanting to have this state. Yeah, I'll, I'll come up here. The state um, of willingness and there are five mantras associated, five vowel um, um, vocalizations. And, and they are, I'll simple, I'll say them. Ta, te, ti, to, tu. And in this, let us open our hearts and let us feel the willingness to be with the divine at whatever the cost and crystallize inside of us a will that is aligned with the divine. And you can imagine when we say the mantras, ta, te, ti, to, tu, 
Imagine Hephaestus with the hammer banging on the anvil, forming through his divine will the beautiful construction. We can hear each of the syllables sounding out as if the hammer is lovingly pounding the artist creating the divine manifesting inside of us. Deep breath and relax. Ta 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 Pause, relax, and remember your purpose. Attempting in the darkness to see into the dark, to perceive. And feel ourselves as ourselves, receiving, being open, willing, for the lightning, the light to come, from this practice, this And again, three more times. A little faster. Ta ta te ti ti to tu tu. Ta ta te ti ti to tu. Ta. Te, to, tu. Intuition is the apprehension of knowledge without the depressing function of reason. Careful observing the mind that wants to narrate, and more so the mind that wants to interpret, that wants to dream, to go someplace else, think apart from being here. Listening, attempting to perceive the divine. Again, three more times. Ta 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 te ti to tu. Ta te ti to tu. Ta te. Now, without losing our attention, let us move to our seats for a brief moment. <clears throat> 